Our last two speakers of the morning will be talking about land transportation and the process and requirements. And that will be brought to us by Kenneth Kobus, who is the Director of Logistics at Charles River Laboratories, and followed by Robert Fernandez, who is the Vice President of Operations and Quality Assurance at Direct Services. So Kenneth? Thank you. So uh, good morning. Um, my name is Ken Kobus. I've been with Charles River for about a year, so I'm still in the learning phase for animal transportation. So this is a great event for me. I've been in logistics forever, um, and our focus of our session is on the ground. But I wanted to take a few minutes to go through the different providers um, that uh, play in this space, because as we've seen already, um, uh, ground plays a significant role in the air transport side as well. Um, additionally, some of the players, uh, get the lines get blurry because they um, may have multiple modes that they uh, play in. Uh, additionally, they may market themselves or try to brand themselves differently uh, from, from that perspective. So I'll go through these different uh, categories. Um, I did leave a couple off, um, basically uh, rail and ocean, um, because they're really not uh, conducive for transporting uh, laboratory animals from a, from a time perspective or conditions. So Parcel Express, that's typically FedEx and UPS that everybody knows. Generally, they um, handle small packages and envelopes, but they'll, they'll also handle large uh, cargo as well. And as we've seen, there are exceptions. They will handle some animals. Um, primarily, take, for example, UPS. will do it through their forwarding arm um, versus their express arm. Um, FedEx and UPS uh, typically will handle uh, a significant amount of biological materials. Um, it's next day, overnight, second day type shipments, and they are global. Courier, typically it's a local ground courier. This is your local uh, company that has a small set of vehicles, generally vans, that are generally not temperature controlled. They may have some, but ge generally it's a, a, a non-temperature controlled service. Same day, next day service, again, small um, quantities. Um, they may handle small animals, particularly on the air freight forwarding side, where they're the pickup or delivery agent for the air freight forwarder, um, or may even be the actual air freight forwarder's agent in, the, in a particular city. Um, so they may act as an air freight forwarder from, from that perspective. The next category is specialty courier. Um, this is typically a regional, but there are some global couriers in this space. Um, this is the companies that generally will work in the um, animal space. It's temperature controlled shipments. They'll book shipments um, basically on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the airlines versus um, having space pre-booked um, where it's consolidated. They'll have their own um, company vehicles in terms of pickup and delivery. Uh, again, some of those will be temperature controlled. They may or may not act as a uh, broker for customs clearance purposes. And um, they will have their own company um, operated offices um, in certain cities and or regions, again, versus using a, an agent in that, that particular locale. Air freight forwarder, we've heard today um, that the airlines um, generally prefer to work with the air freight forwarders. Um, they are global companies in most cases, although some are, um, I'll say, regionally focused. Some will also um, basically say they go everywhere, but some are better than others to certain destinations. So from that perspective, um, it's important to pick a right partner for, from an air freight forwarding perspective. I spent my first 10 years of my career in the air freight forwarding business, so pretty familiar with that, that side of it. Um, they will handle temperature controlled shipments. Some will handle live animals, some will not. Um, again, it's a company decision uh, that they've made. Um, they generally do not have, have their own pickup or delivery vehicles. They're using ground delivery agents. Again, those types of specialty couriers or couriers in, in each city. They may or may not have their own offices. Um, again, um, a lot of times there'll be a corporate office and then they'll use agents in all the particular cities. They'll, they'll also pre-book space with commercial airlines and consolidate shipments from multiple um, providers. Um, they'll also provide next uh, flight out service as well um, to compete with the courier specialty courier arm. Several of them are also brokers from a customs perspective. Um, and uh, the different services that they provide, airport to airport, meaning they'll only handle um, the booking with the airlines. Um, they won't worry about getting it to the airline or from the airline to the final uh, destination. Door to door is the complete service uh, where they'll pick it up and, and ensure delivery all the way through. 
there's airport the door and all these other combinations. Um, the reason I cite those is again the ground uh, delivery implications that are associated with with these shipments that you may think you're giving it to a great forwarder, but it's this local courier company that's coming to pick it up or a local company that's delivering it, and it may not be um, in the type of vehicle that that you had expected. On the ground side, there's dedicated contract carrier, um, which is basically a company where you contract for the services and uh, a defined set of schedules and a number and type of vehicles. The contract will establish the service area, again, and the distances they're going to go to, and again, whether the live animals and temperature control is required for the particular uh, commodity. The vehicles are generally outfitted for transporting animals. Um, you'll see some of that when, when Bob gets up here. Um, they'll generally carry other freight as well, um, but uh, not at the same time as the, the animals um, because it's a contract where you stipulate that. If it's not a dedicated contract carrier and using someone off the, the street, um, then the potential of uh, the animals being co-loaded with other commodities is, is clearly there. Some of the large breeders and other high volume shipments um, may also use a private fleet um, where it's their own company operated uh, trucks and drivers um, versus uh, a dedicated contract carrier. There's on demand carriers, um, which is again a trucking company um, where you can pick up the phone and just uh, call for, for the particular shipment at the time you need it. Um, generally, those are smaller uh, companies. Um, there are some large ones that play in this space, like FedEx Custom Critical. Um, and um, those, uh, again, may be temperature controlled. Um, some um, will, will handle live animals as well. So again, it's uh, dependent on the particular carrier and what their expertise uh, is in that particular space. There may be additional services provided by the dedicated contract carrier. For example, um, they may operate uh, transfer facilities as, as the animals make their way across uh, the, the, the country. Um, pricing is generally high um, because of the special nature of the shipment, the timing, the fact that there is special handling and special ventilation and those types of temperature uh, issues associated with it. The cost um, is fairly significant from, from that perspective. And as, as, as uh, Bill mentioned earlier, uh, distance is a big factor. It is mileage and vehicle type based. So obviously the, the greater distance um, is, is, is significant in terms of cost. A couple other categories in the ground side, there's less than truckload, uh, the, the industry terminology is LTL. Uh, basically this is a common carrier um, that will handle small shipments. They are generally not handling live animals. Some of those companies do have a temperature control division, um, but generally these are the, the companies that are handling um, your supplies and those types of uh, things, um, either on an inbound basis or, or an outbound basis. Things like bedding and feed may come in that way. Um, there's also a truckload um, uh, carrier, which will handle full-size truckloads. Um, again, those are generally common carriers handling large shipments where you're buying that whole truck uh, for the service. And again, it's two to four days depending on where you're going. Same thing, live animals and temperature control may be available depending on the particular carrier um, that you want to utilize for that, that particular service. But it's kind of hard to get that much kind of quantity, um, particularly if you're a small shipper, to make it cost effective. Um, inbound carrier can be any one of the above. I, I bring this in because there's carriers um, where, where you may have suppliers that are bringing you items and those carriers may be interested from a cost perspective to take things back out uh, from your facility. But if they um, don't provide that type of temperature controlled or um, animal type service, it's, it's uh, not going to work. Um, and there's also a, a, a differential provider called the 3PL. We've heard some of this where we've used agents. Um, I've listed these other transport providers, airlines, which we've heard a lot about today. Um, most prefer to work directly with the forwarders versus directly with shippers because shippers don't have enough volume to, to generate the kind of uh, pricing. Um, obviously, air charter um, is, is available, and that's expensive when you're going to buy a plane. Um, and, and depending on where the, the two from combinations are, it can get very expensive. Um, as I mentioned, there's an ocean forward, I don't want to cover it. Um, there's third-party logistics providers. Um, basically, companies will hire another firm to manage all the different carriers. So you may hear that um, terminology. Some of the forwarders, some of the couriers, some of the specialty couriers also may act as a third-party logistics provider. And this is the point about where some of the lines get blurred as to how they may um, want to uh, establish a relationship with you. We've mentioned customs brokers. Um, there are uh, the forwarders that act as a customs broker, but there are also just companies that that's all they do is, is um, customs clearance work. 
There's freight brokers, um, which are primarily in the trucking industry. Um, they're similar to 3PL, but a little different in the sense that of, of the insurance requirements and the types of carriers that they're, they're working with. There's others out there, like I said, that have uh, systems or consulting services that may come in to try to also um, assist in, in the transport uh, arena. Um, people that manage for your freight bills and those types of things may also have uh, partnerships with, with uh, other freight forwarders or, or courier services to try to drive the cost out for you. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the private fleet um, aspect. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Bob, who's going to get into a lot more of the detail of the ground side of things. Um, Bob? Thank you, Ken. Good morning. Uh, let's see. Someone's helping me here. And if you could start that, perfect. Uh, my name is Bob Fernandez. I work for Direct Services. We're a transportation provider. We provide temperature and time sensitive commodity shipment, uh, one of which is live animals. And we're going to talk about ground transportation, specifically ground transportation of live animals in the United States. Uh, we're going to cover the requirements based on the animals, regulations related to the animals, what the shipper is responsible to do, what the carriers or trucking firms are responsible for, some documentation requirements, talk a little bit about liability, and ground transport carrier requirements and characteristics. So we're going to cover these elements. When you want to transport live animals, you have certain goals, that the animals arrive alive and healthy, that they maintain the same biosecurity status they started with at the end of the journey, that they arrive on time, that we meet any regulatory requirements, and that it's safe for the transport personnel. So these are our goals. First thing, we need to understand our animals in transit. Their basic requirements are they need fresh air, they need the proper temperature, they need food, and they need water. So we have to make sure that we provide those during transit. Additionally, the animals have a health or biosecurity status. They can be conventional animals, which are animals that are essentially healthy, but are not specific pathogen-free. Specific pathogen-free meaning they've either been raised in a barrier colony or they've been treated in some way so that a normally occurring pathogen is not present in, these, in this animal model. And this health status is critical for research. So, and the third status would be infectious. Uh, the specific pathogen-free is referred to as SPF. You can maintain control of the health status through the type of mode you use, air, ground, the carrier you choose, and the type of container you put it in. I just want to get infectious live animals out of the way. They almost never ship. I think I've run into one or two in the last 20 years. These are substances no, uh, suspected or known to contain organisms that can harm humans or other animals. They are a hazardous material. They're class six, division 6.2, category A. And as such, you can't transport them unless you have permission from the Associate Administrator for Hazardous Material Safety. You need to prove why you want to ship them and that your methodology is safe. So you, you almost never see them, but I just wanted to get them out of the way since they're a class of animal. Um, transporting animals causes stress. Anybody who traveled here probably experienced similar stress, even if it went well, to get here. You got on a plane, your environment changed. It got noisier. Your diet was different and you probably got out really early to get on the plane. So all of these elements cause stress. And even when everything works properly, you have a good transit to this conference, and the animals have a good transit from point A to point B, there's an element of stress. And our job is to minimize that stress. Now, there are regulations involved. There are law, fines, penalties, and potential loss of license for noncompliance occur. But they're just minimum standards. I mean, we have to do better than just meet the legal requirements. <laughs> Who regulates animals? Well, there's the USDA under the Animal Welfare Act, and APHIS administers it. There's IATA, the International Air Transport Association, which has live animal regulations for airport, air shipments. Now, the reason I'm including them here is, one, it's a great source. They do a very good job of providing information as well as guidance. Two, every air shipment has a ground component, two ground components, to the airport and from the airport. And finally, the Department of Transportation administers hazardous materials, the infectious animals, as well as safety regulations for carriers in general. There are various state departments of health which may have their own requirements or state departments of fish and wildlife. So all these players are in the space uh, with regulations that must be complied with. 
Why is the Animal Welfare Act, why does it exist? Well, it was created to ensure that animals intended for use in research facilities were provided with humane care and treatment, and to ensure that they got that humane care and treatment during transportation. Certain animals are regulated, hamsters, guinea pigs, rabbits, swine, canines, felines, non-human primates. Interestingly enough, rats and mice, which were the big uh, numbers for laboratory animals, are not regulated. However, we, as a carrier, treat them as if they were regulated for two reasons. One, it's the humane thing to do. Two, our truckloads tend to be mixed, regulated and non-regulated. There's no way to treat them anyway, so we treat everything as if it were regulated. There are some USDA food and water requirements. If an animal is in transit for more than six hours, that animal must have access to food and water, sufficient to meet their needs. Food must be offered at least every 24 hours. Water must be offered at least every 12 hours. And we'll see how, we'll talk about how that, these requirements are dealt with. Uh, you've seen SPF cartons, you've seen uh, what's been discussed here, specific pathogen free cartons. These are cartons that must remain sealed for the economic value of the animals to be maintained. If someone opens them in transit to feed and water them, the value of the animals is essentially destroyed. So feeding and watering is not an issue for them because the shipper will provide sufficient food and water, not only for the planned transit, but for additional time built in. Uh, food and water being offered would be to animals that are not specific pathogen free, larger animals. Uh, the USDA also says that animals shall be observed at least every four hours. Well, that is possible if you have a few animals to look at. It's impossible if you have a tractor trailer load filled with rodents to look at. So the USDA is reasonable about this and they expect the carriers to monitor the conditions, to physically examine the cargo space, put your eyeballs on it, reach in, does it feel right? Does it look right? Do I see any obvious signs of distress? If not, we document that we had an observation and we keep moving. Uh, two other items here. Carrier shall not accept the shipment more than four hours prior to scheduled departure. May extend to not more than six hours. Essentially, this is don't take the animals long, uh, earlier than you need them. Uh, this is especially true for airlines. They don't want you to tender a shipment today that's going to start transporting tomorrow. We must shelter animals from rain and snow, direct sunlight and cold weather. Now, there's a 45 minute allowance for sunlight and cold weather, no allowance for rain and snow. Uh, of these, I would say direct sunlight for specific pathogen free crates is a, a, a real danger because of the heat gain that specific pathogen free crates can experience being left in the direct sunlight. So our policy for, for, uh, for my company is that we don't want them any transfer period for any amount of time. We want to minimize that, make it zero if at all possible. Um, I have USDA and IATA container requirements here because they're similar in a lot of ways. They have to be well constructed. They've got to stand up to stacking. We saw crush cartons. They, they, these are transport containers. They're going, they have to face the Samsonite challenge. Their freight handlers are going to be loading them and unloading them. They have to be adequately ventilated. They have to be the right size for the animal. There's got to be enough room for them. They have to be safe for the animal. Uh, they have to keep the animal inside at all times. One for the animal's protection as well as for handlers and for equipment, especially airlines. They must be clean. And if reused, they have to be disinfected. There are biosecurity concerns with reusing cartons. Food and water must be available. They have to be labeled. They have to state live animals. We need directional arrows. What's the top of the box? SPF containers will have filters to prevent contaminant entry into the containers to maintain their biohealth status. They have to be labeled as such so that everybody in the process knows that these are SPF boxes that can't be opened. And you need viewing windows. Uh, one, you need to be able to see what's inside them. Two, governmental agencies may want to see what's inside them and unless they can satisfy themselves, they may open the box and they can't because nobody can stop them. Some more common sense transportation standards. These are related to the cargo areas of vehicles. The cargo space must be designed in such a manner that it protects the health and well-being of the animals and ensures their safety and comfort and prevents the engine, entry of engine exhaust from the primary conveyance. You can't let the engine leak into the cargo department, <coughs> cargo compartment. Common sense. 
The animal cargo space shall have a supply of fresh air that is sufficient for the normal breathing of all animals being transported in it. More common sense. The interior of the animal cargo space must be kept clean. Now this is, a, this is one of those ones that's a minimum standard. Uh, our company has disinfection standards as a specialty carrier that we would disinfect our, our cargo areas and our vehicles and our holding rooms between uses to prevent any contaminants from taking harborage in our, in our holding rooms. Um, another minimum standard, the air temperature around any live animal in a holding area shall not be allowed to fall below 45 nor go above 85. So 45 to 85 is the USDA regulation. The airlines match this. We find that this is a little broad because if you're dealing with a truckload of SPF filtered cartons, those cartons themselves will insulate the animals. The filters insulate the animals. So you have to go with a lower temperature, 55 to 60, to get a temperature inside the crate of 70, 65 to 70. So we had tend to live with a tighter temperature range than 45, 85. We're in more plus or minus five degree range. And we can do that with our equipment. The USDA requires that you have a disaster plan. The animal, plant, animal and Plant Health Inspection Service requires facilities and carriers to have a disaster plan. It's pretty general. They expect you to figure out what kind of disaster am I likely to face? Who is going to do what in an emergency? What do we need? Do we have it? And where's the phone chain? They expect you to train in this plan, and they want you to review it annually. This is a fairly recent requirement. The shipper is responsible. The shipper is responsible for complying with the Animal Welfare Act. The shipper is responsible for the health and welfare of the animals. The shipper is responsible for making sure that the entire route door to door is planned and safe for the animals. For any special care required for pregnant animals, for example. To provide the details of the animals being shipped. What are they? How many are they? What is their gender? Sufficient information to meet the requirements. The shipper is responsible to get all documents veterinary health certificate, permits, to provide suitable containers, to provide food, water, and bedding during the entire transit. So if you need to add more water at some point, the shipper has to make, make sure that those arrangements are made. And it has to be documented because the USDA requires that you prove that you offered food or water or observations, and they want to see that document. You're responsible for contingency planning. What happens if? And they're responsible for the actions of their agents, carriers, for their compliance in the Animal Welfare Act. So you can't just outsource it. You're responsible as the shipper, which means that the carrier is also responsible for compliance with the same elements, the Animal Welfare Act, for the health and welfare of the animals, to know the transportation requirements of a shipment prior to acceptance. A carrier should not accept a shipment unless they know they can do it and that they can provide safe carriage. They've got, they can make suitable transport arrangements. They can provide the appropriate transport conveyance. And that all the documents that are going to be necessary in this transit are present, as well as meeting all regulatory requirements. Documentation. At its most basic, we need a shipping document that says, what are we shipping? How many cartons? How many animals? What are they? Where is it going? For, oh, actually, where is it originating from? Where is it going? Who are the contacts at each end? We need 24-hour available phone contacts at each end. We need a health certificate from a veterinarian. Are we going through a state that requires state permits? We need those. For USDA regulated shipments, there are records of acquisition, disposition, or transport. We need the appropriate document for those. Liability. Uh, in the IATA book, which has a great section there, it says carriers are not liable for loss due to natural causes or the inherent nature of the shipment. It's live cargo. There may be some loss, even if you do everything right. And carriers are not going to be responsible for the nature of the product. They are responsible to do a good job, but they're not responsible if they do everything right. And yeah. loss is usually limited to a value much less than the shipper's value. This is either stated in the contract, or it's negotiated. And one thing to note, that not all carriers may have live cargo insurance. Some will have cargo insurance, which means the box got there intact, but everything, but nothing to do with the animals, whereas some carriers will specifically have live cargo insurance. And you can find that out by reviewing the certificate of ins insurance for your carrier. So we, we've talked about a transportation plan. And this is, you need this for every transit. 
we make, have to make sure we have the right temperature, fresh air, food and water requirements are met, do we have the right boxes to put them in, segregation requirements. These are typically on a, uh, with a given shipper. Let's say a given shipper says, I only want my animals to be on that truck. So that's a, a, a contract element. But it's a requirement for that given shipment. Uh, where are we, what's the distance for the transit and how long is it going to take? Have we made all the appropriate uh, planning for it because if we're going to go across country we need to have teams of drivers involved. Have we done con contingency planning and again do we have a documentation? Do we have all our documents? Now a ground transport transporter is going to have certain characteristics. They're going to tend to have better or more environmental control than air transport. Uh, we use refrigeration units so we have a tighter temperature range, smaller variation. Uh, you can have a disinfected cargo area, and we can control what, what's on that truck. You can also typically ship larger quantities together. So if you have a large load, you can put them all in the same transport uh, bill of lading, so they can all travel together. Personnel tend to be trained for a specific commodity. Now, I mentioned earlier that air has ground components to and from the airport, so there's going to be a ground element in all transit. Uh, ground transport can be more expensive than air for smaller long distance shipments. If you have one box to go across country, it's much cheaper to give it to an airline than it is to drive a truck 3,000 miles across the country. Other ground transport characteristics. Freight doesn't tend to get bumped. Uh, there are not going to be other animal shipments on board unless it's allowed by contract. There aren't going to be pets involved unless it's allowed by contract. There are not unlikely to be human cadavers taking precedence as you might have in air transport. It's not subject to temperature embargo because it's all temperature controlled. And again, the segregation of shipments can transport on an exclusive use basis, meaning the only freight on that truck in that holding room is what the shipper wants, which allows great control. What is a ground carrier? Well, a ground carrier has to be registered with the USDA if for regulated animal carriage. So if you're going to tra transport USDA regulated animals, you have to be registered with the USDA. And you're subject to USDA inspections. They will show up. Interstate carriers have to be registered with the United States Department of Transportation, the DOT. They have to be assigned a DOT number. They have to meet DOT insurance requirements for liability and cargo. Since the DOT has safety regulations administered by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, what does that mean? It means road checks which are performed by state police agents or, or state agencies. They stop trucks and they check them to make sure that the driver is meeting the legal requirements of his hours of service, is the vehicle safe to operate. And those, the results of those road checks are fed into something called the safety measurement system. And scores are, de are developed so that when two trucks pull into a way station, the inspector there can look up on the computer the safety scores of those two carriers. And the one with the worst safety score is the one that he's going to look at. And the one with the good safety score, he's going to say, go on through. So it does, have, it, it does make a difference. They get more road checks for poor performing carriers. And if you really get bad in safety, you're going to get an audit. The DOT is going to show up at your office and say, I want to look at all your safety records. I want to see your mechanical records. And unsafe carriers are shut down. It happens. Uh, additionally, they produce safer scores, which are available at safer.fmcsa.com. DOT.gov, uh, you can look up carriers. How good are they? Are they better than average, worse than average? Typical ground carrier network is going to be either hub and spoke or a straight line with some hubs going off of it, depending upon the coverage area. And there'll be larger vehicles tending to pick up shipments from uh, origination points going to distribution hubs where freight is reloaded segregated and sorted out in onto maybe another line hall to go to another hub uh, or they go out on delivery runs to the local customers. Um, hubs will be equipped with temperature controlled holding areas, will have temperature alarms and security systems. There are also hot shot special delivery runs. These are got to go right now where you'll have, it, it could be across the street or across the country where one, two, three, ten crates, small shipments it's critical and they're called hot shots. And it, it's, it's very unusual and very expensive. Uh, another element of a ground carrier network would be team operated runs. 
Now, Bill mentioned before the bus concept. So the normal distribution system is the bus system. The passengers get on at origin plants. They go through various, they get on a bus to go to a terminal. And that terminal, they get rerouted onto another bus and then finally get to their destination. Um, the hotshot stuff would be a taxi service. Essentially, you're calling a cab to go from New York to Chicago. And the rates are similar to driving a cab from New York to Chicago. <laughs> Here's an example of a tractor and temperature control trailer. Uh, in the front here, I'm going to use the lightsaber. I'm going to try to. Here we go. This is the power unit, the tractor. Behind it is a, tr is a sleeper unit for the drivers to sleep if they're going cross country. One driver will be sleeping, one driver will be driving. So the truck continues to move except for fuel and rest and meal breaks. Uh, behind it is the trailer with a temperature control unit. Here's a picture of a dual refrigeration system trailer. Because of the nature of the commodities, it's live freight, we have a primary refrigeration unit and a backup refrigeration unit. These are completely redundant systems. You don't normally need this for temperature control freight, regular temperature control freight, because regular temperature control controlled freight doesn't breathe, i.e. doesn't need fresh air to come in, and doesn't generate its own heat. So if you lose a reefer with a load of some temperature control product that's not alive, you keep the door shut and the insulation will cover you for a couple of hours, certainly enough time to get to a relief point. With live freight, you don't have that luxury. So were this entire 48-foot trailer filled with live animals, You've got a lot of heat gain, and you have a very short time to make, to, to, to fix your problem. So if you lose a primary temperature control system, you just go and flip the switch, turn on the backup, and you move on down the road. It's great because it saves the animals, and it maintains the schedules. The same concept is used in our dual refrigeration system trucks, one and two, so it's a smaller box. Uh, again, we have the power unit here with a sleeper so that two drivers can operate this moving down the road. This is a smaller vehicle, a Sprinter van. This would be more of a local delivery vehicle. And this is inside the Sprinter van. You can see one temperature control unit. You can also see vents. These are emergency vents, and we would have auxiliary fans in there. The inside of this is a sprayed-in liner, which is seamless, inorganic compound that's non-porous. This allows us to easily disinfect this this uh, vehicle. And all of our vehicles, because of the nature of the commodities we carry, have this similar characteristic. How do you load the cartons? There's been some talk about loading cartons and maintaining uh, spacers and airflow. Here's a properly loaded uh, inside a truck. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cartons on the floor. You'll notice none of them are crushed because we can go eight high with these cartons, and that's what our procedures say. And then you'll see air channels between each stack to allow for, fresh, for air to move through and for an even temperature within the entire load. We, have, we build a second deck. Again, there's another air plenum here for airflow to move between the load. And then more channels for the air, air to flow. So you get a nice even temperature flow. And then load locks should be put at the back of this to keep everything from moving. So the freight's not going to shift. It's got a good loading pattern to have a nice even distribution of temperature, which is critical because these are SPF cartons. And as I mentioned earlier, they tend to retard heat transfer because of the filter, as well as you can see all these other cartons acting as insulation. So you need, need to run at a cooler temperature, 55 to 60, to get a temperature inside that box of about 70 degrees, 65 to 70. Uh, so ground carrier temperature control equipment, we utilize commercially available refrigeration and air conditioning systems, carriers, thermo kings, because they have a widespread support and repair network. And just a note, we, while we do a great job with temperature, we also do as good a job as we can with noise. The quietest refrigeration systems available are chosen, but the refrigerated cargo area is not a quiet room. Uh, we are capable of tighter temperature ranges than the USDA required 45 to 85. Again, we're probably plus or minus 5 degrees with the fresh air intake. And humidity is generally maintained between 40 to 70 percent relative humidity, and that's really a byproduct of how we maintain temperature. The, pro the act of maintaining temperature will remove humidity from the cargo area. Uh, we have emergency temperature control systems, redundant temperature control, auxiliary fans, and emergency fresh air vents. 
So we have different strategies depending upon the size of the vehicle. We also have temperature monitoring and communications equipment. We have a temperature tracking systems which include in-cab temperature displays for the driver to be able to see and alarms, electronic temperature recording devices so that there's an electronic record of the temperatures. Uh, we, are, we have some vehicles equipped with radio temperature alarm pagers for the drivers when they're away from their vehicle or in a sleeper so that the alarm will go off and the radio pager can reach him up to a mile away should he be in a restaurant or a rest area. Uh, we have remote temperature and GPS tracking devices capable of alerting our central dispatch to exceptions, exceptions related to temperature or geofencing, an unauthorized location. And all of our drivers are given cell phones. So communications are very important to us. We have special procedures and practices. We have to have them because we have to meet the animal's requirements and the regulatory requirements of animal handling, which include feeding and watering, fresh air access, the proper temperature, and regulatory compliance and documentation of regulatory compliance. We have segregation practices to maintain the biosecurity status. We have loading practices to safely and securely load shipments and maintain proper airflow. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we disinfect our vehicles and holding areas between uses, and our personnel use PPE, personal protective equipment, to protect them from the shipment and the shipment from them. Uh, we have security practices which require that the vehicles remain locked. Uh, we have practices to protect the shipping information. Uh, and we have to document this for every trip on a manifest and bill of lading, the most basic freight stuff, uh, proof where I picked it up and where I delivered it, as well as the animal handling records to record USDA requirements. Our drivers are trained and our personnel are trained in operating the equipment. We have emergency procedures and strategies for temperature control failures and accidents. There, these type of emergencies tend to be uniquely uh, unique in that the set of circumstances is always a little different. So we train our people on strategies and what the most important elements are, what they're trying to safeguard at given a given emergency. Uh, we train our people on safe driving and we have recurring training in the form of classes on procedures, practices, and forms, as well as on-the-job training. Personnel. We train our personnel. We train them to properly handle the animals, to properly monitor the environmental conditions, and to react to emergency situations. This is kind of a cool picture. It's the, uh, what a driver sees when he looks in the rearview mirror and sees the temperature on his refrigeration unit and its operational status. And this is the driver, I guess, checking the settings. Our drivers are DOT regulated. What does that mean? Well, we have to have drug and alcohol screening, both pre-employment and random recurring. Uh, we have to review 10 years of employment history. They're subject to hours of duty regulations, hours of service regulations, excuse me. That's a maximum of 70 hours a week. After a driver has 70 on duty hours a week, he has to reset his clock by taking a 34 hour consecutive break, which includes two rest periods of 1 to 5 a.m. This is relatively new and has caused a lot of grief in the trucking industry. That the, the 1 to 5 a.m. stipulations sometimes become a little difficult to deal with. But you got to do it. Maximum on duty time of 14 hours, maximum of 11 hour driving, uh, and they're required to take a 30 minute break within the first eight hours of a shift. Uh, we do TSA security threat assessment so that we vet our people so they can handle freight that's going to go on an aircraft. And we're doing this in the face of a national driver shortage with a lot of drivers becoming no-touch drivers, which means they basically drive it from point A to point B and someone else loads and unloads it, which makes our drivers who have to put their hands on the freight and have a hands-on approach all the more valuable. In summary, an effective ground transportation is going to address the key elements of the animal requirements. It's going to have the right temperature. It's going to make sure they have right food and water, and it's going to make sure they have fresh air. It's going to meet the regulatory requirements and document that it met those requirements, and it will have an element of disaster contingency planning. Uh, my sources for this were the Animal Welfare Act, Title VII, the Animal Welfare Regulations, 9 <coughs> CFR, the IATA Live Animal Regulations, the most current version, and uh, transportation, uh, 49 CFR. Thank you very much.
Thank I, you, Ken and Robert. And oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I had a point of clarification. The USDA um, contingency plan rule is on hold. So there is no training requirement for contingency planning. Of course, we recommend uh, you know, emergency planning. The current system or the way things are set up, um, especially when you're transporting animals, that destination, um, you have to have a contact number for the person that is supposed to pick up the animals. And there's some inherent things built in, but the contingency plan rule is on hold right now. So there is no requirement to train your staff or anything. We hope, and I cannot tell you right now when that rule will come off of indefinite hold. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our two speakers, and there will be time to ask them questions this afternoon.